good afternoon, everyone. We are just, uh, uh, just past noon, so we're going to kick off this panel on scaling uh, green bonds. Let me begin by quickly introducing ourselves as a panel. I'm going to be the moderator for this one. My name is Monish Mahurkar. I'm with IFC Treasury, which is, uh, which is responsible for financing IFC's balance sheet and managing its uh, liquidity. And as part of that, we also issue green bonds quite actively. And in fact, we were among the early issuers uh, in this market. And in particular, IFC was uh, uh, instrumental in mainstreaming the market when we started issuing benchmark size issuances back in 2011-12. Back in uh, to my left is Ranabir Mukherjee from, uh, he, from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. He is managing director and vice chairman uh, of global banking and markets, Asia Pacific and he is uh, a senior coverage banker for clients in the region. Um, and he's previously <coughs> served as head of debt capital markets at UBS as well. And further to the left is Manish Chaurasia. He is the managing director of Tata Cleantech Capital, uh, which is actually, interestingly, a joint venture between IFC and, and Tata Capital. And TCCL, as it's called for short, it offers renewable energy and clean tech financing solutions uh, in India. And, and Manish himself, prior to this role, was involved in, the, in India's first IDF. He led the launch of the first infrastructure debt fund uh, at ILNFS. Um, further to his left is uh, Satish Mandhana. He is the managing partner for private equity and sustainable initiatives at IDFC Alternatives. And this is a leading multi-class asset manager uh, with assets under management of over three and a half billion in India. And, and Satish was previously managing partner and CIO of IDFC alternate investments, including private equity, real estate, and infra investments. And he has served prior roles at uh, JK Paper as CFO and head of strategy at G Capital, SRF Finance, et cetera. And then to our extreme left is Jean-Marie Dumas. Uh, we are very happy to have him join us. He flew down especially from Paris for this uh, conference. He is the head of fixed income solutions at uh, Amundi, which as many of you might know, is the largest European uh, asset manager with AUMs of uh, close to $1.4 trillion or euros. When you're at that scale, it doesn't matter uh, whichever currency it is, <laughs> $1.4 trillion uh, uh, and higher. Um, they're based in Paris, and uh, very happy to note that IFC has recently entered into a partnership with Amundi, whereby they're going to be managing a fund, a special fund which we call Green Cornerstone Bond Fund, GCBF, which is dedicated to investing in green bonds being issued out of uh, emerging markets. So very relevant to, you know, to, to today's uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. um, so before, before I you know, introduce the topic a little bit. Let me also invite uh, everyone hmm. here in the audience uh, to engage with us a little bit uh, using the uh, event app that hopefully by now you have downloaded. And if you, if you scroll or if you open this particular event on your app, Scaling Green Bond Solutions, where you will see the list of speakers and the topic, scroll below and you'll see a list of polling questions. What we're going to do to just you know, engage you in this discussion on green bonds, I'm going to be asking some of these polling questions which are there, and using that app, you can select your answer from one of the alternatives given. And if the technology works, we will see how the audience is uh, polling the answers on the screen, and uh, let's see how, how close the answers are to what the actual answer might be. So if, if you're good to go, I'm going to actually ask the first question. Can I, can I ask just by a show of hands, who all are ready to poll and answer the question on the app? Are most of the folks ready here? So looks like most of, most of, most of you are. Mm. Uh, so while, while a couple of others at the back who are looking at the app and scrolling into those questions, let me just mention a couple of things about what green bonds really are. Uh, this is an expert audience, so I don't need to talk a lot about it, but basically, a, a green bond is a relatively simple instrument. It is still based on the credit and obligations of the issuer like that issuer as any, any other bond, except that there is a commitment from the issuer to 
ring fence the proceeds raised from the bonds and use them only for certain eligible green finance projects, primarily in renewable energy, uh, energy efficiency, and a few others uh, in, in, that, in that category. And, and the, the standards, at least in the global markets, the standards have been developed voluntarily by the industry, by groups of issuers, investors, and uh, investment banks coming together in, in the form of what are called green bond principles. So that's essentially in, in brief what the green bond is. So with that quick introduction, let me switch to the polling. And my first question that you will probably see as you click on polling question one is how many of you, um, or who, who was the first issuer of green bonds in Asia? So that's the first question. You have three choices that you can choose from. Choice A is Korea Exim Bank, Kexim, some of you know. The People's Bank of China, or PBOC. And the third choice is Asian Development Bank, or ADB. So please click your answer quickly from one of those three choices, and then we can ask our uh, technology experts to project the answers on the screen. I'm assuming that most of you have clicked on the answers by now? Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. So can we please uh, load the answers on the screen? Okay, yeah. Okay. It's there. It's right there. Oh, sorry. We don't see it on the main screen behind? Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, you're oh, seeing it on the side screen. Uh, side okay, screen. sorry. I, I wasn't able to see it. Uh, okay, let me see now. So we have 41% of you who voted uh, Kexen. About, if I read the number correctly, it's about 18% voting for PBOC and 41% between uh, for Asian Development Bank. So it looks like the, the, the house is equally divided between Kexen and, and ADB. Uh, which is interesting, but just so you know, the correct answer is actually Korea XN Bank. Okay. So uh, that's for your information. I'm going to move on to the next question. KBC question. <laughs> Again, you can scroll down to polling question two on your app. Total cumulative green bond issuance so far globally. So this is a global data point. So what do you believe? is the cumulative issuance. This market has been around for now seven, eight years or so. So what been the cumulative green bond issuance as, as we speak? So you have four choices, 200 billion, 300 billion, 900 billion, or is it just 50 billion? So make your choice. Oh, people are pretty quick to vote. So I'm assuming most of you have already polled your answer. And what you'll see on the screen is we have about 40, well, it's changing, it's evolving, it's quickly changing, but 41% at 200 billion, 41% at 300 billion. So the house is, again, here is roughly equally divided between 200 and 300, and a few, about 14% at 50, and 4% at 900 billion. So I think the house has got it reasonably reasonably close to where the numbers are. Uh, as we speak, the cumulative market is about 300 billion. So, so I think pretty close. Uh, so that's our second question. Switching to the third question now. Um, this is an interesting one. How many sovereign green bonds have been issued to date? You probably all know that most of the market has been corporates and financial institutions globally. But how many? sovereign green bonds have been issued by countries so far. So you have three choices. If you go down to your polling question three, is it just one sovereign, three sovereigns, or five sovereigns? Oh, that's quick. This is, this is, this is a, third question is different. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I, sorry, uh, did I, I think I mixed up the questions here. So let, let's, let's restart, yeah? Let's restart because I don't want to, some people may have voted for a different question. So the third question, pardon my error here, how many individual issuers have issued uh, green bonds? So please vote on this one. How many individual issuers have issued green bonds? 
and the choices are 38, and this is global, please, please note this is global, 11, 150, or 500. So please vote on this one. It's quickly evolving, and we seem to be, we seem to be coming close to, there's a reasonable number who seem to believe it's just 38 issuers globally, 40%. Um, and another 30% or so seem to believe there are 150 issuers. No, that's going up. So evenly balanced <coughs> between 38 and 150 <coughs> seems to be the sense of the house. Very few believe that it's only 11 issuers globally, and similarly, a very few in the house seem to believe it's only it's as much as 500 issuers. So the answer in this case is 500 issuers. So. Mm -hmm. That gives you a sense of mm. how the market has grown in the last few years. Mm. So you have as many as 500 issuers have actually issued green bonds cumulatively so far. And now back to my earlier question, which I mixed up earlier. How many sovereign green bonds have been issued so far? So please go down to your question four, polling question four in your app. How many sovereign green bonds mm. have been issued mm. so far globally? All right. Okay. The choice of one, three, and five. So most people seem to believe three sovereign issuers so far. At a little over half the house, 40% at five issuers, swinging a little bit more towards three, and very few believe it's just one. So this one, this one, all of you seem to have got it spot on, or at least more than half, 60% seem to have got it spot on. It is indeed three issuers which have issued. Um, I will not give the names because the next question actually talks about the names, <laughs> so, you, so, so you can figure it out from the next question. Um, so we move to question number five. Who was the first sovereign issuer of green bonds globally? So your choices are France, Nigeria, and Poland. Okay, so how is divided evenly between France and Poland with very few voting for Nigeria and uh, swinging a bit towards France. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, and here the interesting answer is that among the three issuers that you answered in the, in the previous question, among the three issuers, the first actually, first sovereign issuer earlier this year uh, was Poland. So they were the first issuer of green bonds uh, and I'll just, for the sake of information, the second sovereign issuer was France, and the third, globally, is actually the government of Fiji in Asia. So those are the three sovereign issuers so far. And I'm gonna ask one last question before we move on to the panel. Um, this is more, this, this particular question doesn't have any definitive answer, it's a question of your judgment. So this question, polling six, question six, what is the biggest challenge to scaling up green bonds in South Asia? South Asia or India, as you prefer. And the four choices here are lack of projects, investable projects, investor demand, inconsistent standards, or lack of environmental data. Um, and let's see what the, what the audience feels about this one. All right. So most people seem to believe that it's about inconsistent standards. That's a large, large majority of you all, too nearly yeah, 50 to 60 percent. Some of you feel it's investor demand as well, so those, those are the two. But like I said, this question doesn't have a definitive answer. The, prob the answer will probably evolve mm -hmm. during the course of the discussion of the mm -hmm. panel, and we'll find out from our experts. Uh, so let me, without further ado, so this, thank you for this. This is great. Uh, I think the audience clearly has uh, a good idea of what's going on in the global green bond markets. And with that, um, I'm just going to briefly mention, we define green bonds. I, I did mention earlier that the market has been growing quite rapidly. We have quite a few different issuers you saw through these questions. So I'm going to now turn to Ranubir, uh, given his personal involvement and Bamel's involvement in uh, leading a number of green bond transactions around the world. That if you could share a little bit of your perspective on how the markets evolved, what's been happening globally, sure. specifically in Asia, and what do you see happening in India? Sure. Thanks, Manish, and thank you, IFC, for giving me the opportunity to, to talk to the panel. As Manish mentioned in his uh, opening dialogue, this is an asset class which has seen explosive growth. 
And uh, one of the panelists asked me earlier that why do people issue green bonds? Uh, what is the main advantage? And we dis have discussed this at length uh, within BAMU. And we come down to about three or four points. The first, of course, is in terms of very positive PR. Being socially responsible, being environmentally friendly is something which is growing in importance. And it's not just driven by the issuers need to do it, but from the demand by the investors that issuers do commit to getting a better green footprint. So first is the positive PR. The second, we've started to see pricing benefit as well coming in. Initially, there was really no pricing difference because this was just a different asset class. Investors were getting used to it. But now we're starting to see the better quality invest issuers get also a pricing benefit in addition to the PR. The third, and this is very important, is in terms of investor diversification. From all the green bonds that we even led out of India, we've seen about 16 to 20% of the investors coming from new SRI, or socially responsible investors, who would not have invested in these bonds had they not been classified green. And lastly, I guess it's in terms of inclusion into the new green bond indices. The BAML indices, it was the first one in 2014. Now there's an MSCI Bloomberg index in 2015. And obviously, an in indices inclusion carries its own benefits. So as Manish mentioned, we have seen an explosive growth. Since 2016, there have been 150 new green bond issuers. New entrants continue to, to be dominated by new ad issuer classes such as munis in the US, continuing growth in corporates and financials out of Europe and US, and explosively out of Asia, led mostly by China. Today, about 17% of total new issuance is dominated by China. If you look at, in terms of currencies of issuance, a few years ago, there was no issuance in CNY or Chinese uh, yuan. Today, in 2017, 14% of total issuance comes from CNY. USD is still the highest, but we can see the shift towards newer currencies, newer products. In terms of overall where we see the market growing, I think we do see the market growing exponential. Uh, BAML is a very leading partner in the Green Bond Initiative in overall climate control. Uh, from our side, we have committed 125 billion US towards low carbon banking in 2015 over a 10 year period. And we're, we're well on our way to achieve this. Just in terms of how quickly that footprint has grown, we had committed 40 billion first, then 90 billion five years ago, and now we're at 125 billion. We have led several of the green bonds out of Asia. We led the first Kexim bond, that was the first one that Monish had put out. Very quickly after we did Kexim, we saw Japanese issuers, Mizuho, SMBC, come to the markets, followed again very quickly by the Chinese and Hong Kong issuers, MTRC, Link Reed, and then the big Chinese banks, ABC, ICBC, and of course, BOC. And for ICBC, it was the first time we even did a dual tranche bond between dollars and euros. So we continue to see the market grow. We continue to see our footprint going. We continue to see the evolution of the green bond principles, which Munish had mentioned first. Now, not only are there green bond principles, but there are social bond principles, which in addition to having a green, green footprint, has a social beneficial social impact on, on the overall population that the bond addresses. So we continue to see the markets getting more sophisticated, more investors coming in, and this is something we find very exciting to be a part of. Thank you, Manish. Thanks, thanks, Ranadir. So, so clearly, uh, it looks like there's a lot of activity, a lot of different issue words uh, that is evident from the transactions you have led, uh, Ranadir, from BAML globally and in the region. So picking up on that, now Manish, at Tata Clean Tech, given your entire focus, exclusive focus is on, you know, on, on clean green finance. And I know you have been considering issuing and financing a part of your balance sheet through green bonds. So what is your perspective on the challenges and questions that you're looking at in issuing in the Indian market, or frankly, even in the dollar market? So either way, what is your perspective there? Sure. Uh, thanks, Manish, uh, for giving this opportunity. Uh, so uh, from the Indian context and from the context of the issuer, as uh, Ranveer uh, rightly pointed out, uh, one of the key benefit is that we get access to a new investor class. But if you really see uh, what has happened in India, a uh, lot of issuances have come. I think more than 20 issuances, uh, aggregating about 6 billion US dollars. 
now uh, most of the issuers uh, have got access to a new investor class, but they have not really benefited in terms of pricing or in terms of covenants, uh, which is normally the expectation of the issuers. Now, one of the key reason is that this has remained an offshore market. Uh, and if you issue, say, in US dollars, then you have this cost of hedging. And in India, because the hedge market is uh, a very, it's a very shallow market, generally the cost of hedging is very high, uh, because of which the overall cost of issuance uh, goes up. So there was a new innovation. People came out of what is called masala bond, which is essentially offshore issuance, but in the local currency. Now there, uh, for issuer, it's a great thing to do. But uh, when it comes to uh, central government, the challenge is that central government can now, cannot allow this uh, in an unbridled fashion. Because eventually, this offshore investors will buy back the uh, dollars from RBI. And that time, it could lead to some issues in the currency. So it's very important from the Indian context that a domestic uh, green bond market should develop. Now, for this development, actually, there are some low-hanging fruits. Uh, one is that we have got huge investor base in the form of insurance companies, in the form of pension funds, in the form of mutual funds. And if I see just pension funds and insurance companies alone, the corpus would be about, say, 700 to 800 uh, billion US dollars. Now, this investor class is definitely looking for a new asset class. But the issues which are there is that uh, some of the regulations uh, bar these investors from investing in any asset which, the, which is rated below AA. And typically what you will find is that most of the issuers, uh, because they are in a project finance, these issues, even after some kind of a, some kind of a credit enhancement, never goes beyond A to A+. Plus. So there is a need to see if this rating barrier can be reduced a bit. It need not come down significantly, but maybe from AA, if it comes down to, to A, then suddenly a lot of money would be available for this particular segment. Uh, that is one. Secondly, for insurance companies, there are other intents. Uh, like uh, they can invest only, say, 10% of the investing company's network in one particular company. So typically, as far as the issuers are concerned, uh, in a SPV, the net worth is very low because these projects have high level of depreciation. So that means that one investor can invest a very small amount. So these are some of the irritants when it comes to big investors. But the bigger issue is uh, you know, reducing the risk in these uh, projects. So right now, when it comes to green, we talk only about renewables. But going forward, probably we'll be talking about energy efficiency, probably about water. So the biggest issue in India is that the off-takers, uh, they currently don't have that kind of a financial wherewithal. And there's this always the issue whether they will delay payments and, uh, and you know, some kind of a fear that they can't even default. So right now, while uh, the government has taken some big steps, like the Uday scheme, to improve the solvency of these uh, state discoms, but what is required is structures which basically reduce the off-taker risk. Uh, there have been this kind of structures in the past. Uh, there was an auction in Reva in Madhya Pradesh, which was a 750 megawatt auction. And that was very well structured, where the evacuation risk was uh, addressed through deemed generation clause. Uh, similarly, the payment risk was addressed uh, uh, through a proper uh, escrow account. So I think there's a need to work on the reduction in the risk of the off-takers. If that happens, then automatically the market will go up. The third thing I would like to point out is some anomalies in the loan market. Today what is happening is that uh, the lenders are uh, giving loans which are floating rate to these kind of projects, and these are long-term loans of 15 years. For the last three few years, this has been going on very well because the interest rates have been coming down. But if interest rate starts going up, then it can create a huge problem. And because of this particular anomaly, the debt market is, uh, the corporate bond market is not developing because the corporate bond market generally is a fixed rate market in India. So I think if these three anomalies are addressed, uh, then a green bond market can increase uh, significantly, the domestic green market, and which will have a multiplier impact. Okay, thank, thank you, Manish. And I think these issues are probably not that different even in the global markets in that it's still a largely high quality, high credit market backed by the same, it's more corporate finance as opposed to project finance, project finance. Uh, you know, related issues. So no, thank you for that, uh, for that perspective. Uh, now turning over to Satish, I mean, you have, as an investor um, at IDFC PE, a number of your investee companies in this sector who could be potential issuers. So what is your guidance to them and where do you see the opportunities from their perspective? Yeah, I think uh, as uh, IDFC, 
$3.2 billion fund. We have invested into multiple renewable energy companies in this country. Minority investment to the controlling stakes in many of those. And uh, many of our companies have tried to issue green bonds uh, without much success up till now. Uh, there have been ground level challenges. A few of them have been mentioned by Manish uh, in relation to the rating issues, in relation to the size of the issue. But more importantly, uh, I would uh, like to also emphasize the need for uh, creating a domestic market for these green bonds. Invariably, a green infrastructure project in India will generate revenue in Indian rupees. There is no green infrastructure project in India which is generating revenues in dollar stream. Mm. And hence, the need for the end user or actual user is to have an instrument which is rupee denominated. So masala bond is a kind of a welcome thing, but as Manish pointed out, there are issues around that also for a normal Indian company to go ahead and do it. Uh, so the need is basically to channelize the domestic capital into the green infrastructure in a, in a green bond manner. And I get reminded of uh, IDFC itself in 97 when it got created, the objective was to channelize the private capital into the infrastructure in the country. And there's an institution which came into being, it served the purpose extremely well. Over the years it became the leading institution catalyzing the infrastructure over here. What it does is to mitigate the, some of the risks which Manish talked about, being an institution, it is able to raise bonds on a collateral of assets which may not be individually as optimal, but collectively they are able to mitigate the risk around it and get a, get a better rating over there. So this is one phenomena which is required probably. Similarly, liquidity of these bonds is another bit which we need to have uh, to think about. And there has to be some market mechanism of a market maker equivalent to be there to facilitate a green bond issuance uh, in the Indian context, uh, which is currently it's a very illiquid market. Lastly, the beneficial interest has to come to the end supplier. The money is being provided by whoever is being provided. Some of the benefits which uh, we talk about in the beginning are the benefits which a corporate can enjoy. Mm. But if you are trying to channelize the private capital, uh, then these are to be something with the tax incentives or some kind of a submission around it, which the government can think of to really being participating into this whole space over there. So those are the kind of things which I like to say that can be done probably to catalyze uh, the green bond market in the Indian context. Excellent. No, thank you. Thank you for that perspective. So, so with this, after this little bit of deep dive into some of the Indian uh, specific issue or challenges from uh, Manish and, and Pratish, I'm going to turn it over to Jean-Marie. And for, if you could comment a little bit from an investor perspective, uh, from a global uh, yeah. you know, green bond market, and also specifically if you could comment on this particular platform that we are building together and how it could help address some of the issues that we just heard about. Yes, for sure. Let's, let's take my hat of international investor, I would say, and um, give you the broad picture. That's first step, and green bonds was really in developed countries and uh, mainly driven by uh, European issuers, I would say. And for sure, now we have a clear trend uh, towards emerging markets, and I think that the partnership we have with IFC um, by issuing uh, big funds of other than uh, 1.5 billion US dollar on a global emerging green bond fund in Q1 2018 is clearly in that direction. Um, and in that fund, there will be for sure room for Indian bonds. Um, but what is important to notice is that the success of the green bond market is based on one simple thing, is that a green bond is a, is a bond first, a vanilla bond, I mean. It is not a project bond, it is not a securitization. So first you rely on the credit uh, worthiness of the issuer itself. So that's the first point, um, and that's perhaps one of the big, biggest challenge uh, in many uh, emerging countries, is that the issuers must be ready uh, to adopt the standards of the green bond principles uh, for their uh, project, and also for their reporting and having a sort of um, ESG reporting or ESG referential, uh, because it's part of the green bond principles, not today, but uh, going into that direction. And that's very important because um, as we put green to the bone, green must be green and not gray at the end. And that's perhaps uh, if we want this market to go on into that uh, big growth, uh, we need to be sure that everyone will be happy with what it represents and that there will be not too much controversy. Um, and uh, I know that, for example, in certain countries which are uh, very uh, related and, uh, with 
internal economy which relies on commodities, for example, it is a big challenge because you will find many, many companies with, no, with the name associated to uh, something which is perhaps not so green. So the idea that if we want to have impact, we have to deal with that kind of issue, but we have to do it properly. And so that's, that's perhaps uh, one of the main things. So that's why with that initiative we, has, we, we have with IFC and with all the communication we can do within the Green Bond Principles Executive Committee, we'll have a big work to do on the second opinion provider. I mean that it's not only a certification by the classical big four you can have. You know, we do not uh, rely on auditors for that. We must rely on specialists, local champions, which are not uh, conflicted with the issuer to give uh, the trust we require as investors. Mm -hmm. So, but clearly, mm -hmm. remaining as vanilla bond market is very important because it's the way we can attract all the big investors all over the world and even have first development in an easy way. You know, I, I quoted uh, the project bond, for example. You know that all over the world, the project bond market never succeeded mm. in finding a big and important uh, AUM, I would say. Yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you, jean mm -hmm. So now let me come back to the panel with uh, a couple of specific questions. I have two, let's say, separate uh, thoughts in my mind, and let's see how we can try and address them with the help of the panel. So the first question would be your suggestion on one specific thing that could be done to kickstart the bond market, the green bond market specifically in India. If there was one specific thing that we could do. Uh, I don't know, Manish, if you want to comment on that uh, first, what would be your top? So uh, you uh, have to have regulations hmm. which make it easier for the big investors in India, mm. like insurance companies, pension funds, and mutual funds, mm -hmm. to invest into this market. Yeah. So that, I think, would be the biggest step uh, in this direction. OK. Yeah. Now, I, know, I think we were talking about this earlier. It's, it's interesting that in India, maybe there is an opportunity to have a kind of a regulatory uh, requirement, because India has a long history of directed credit in the form of priority mm -hmm. sector lending. So it's possible that a subset of that could be potentially mm -hmm assigned for green green investment. Mm -hmm. uh, but Ranobir, in the international yeah. market, we have not seen this. So what, what has driven <coughs> But what we have yeah. seen, Manish, mm -hmm. is several regulators or mm -hmm. governments across the globe mm -hmm. starting to clarifying or encouraging green bond issuance. Mm -hmm. So Singapore, for example, the MAS came out with the green bond grants earlier this year, where it says it absorbs some of all of the expenses involved mm -hmm. with issuance of green bonds. Mm -hmm. Similarly, we saw China issuing its green bond handbook based on the green bond, original green bond principles, mm. which led to explosive growth in green bond issuance. Mm. We've seen the Frankfurt Initiative, we've seen the UK government initiatives. Mm. So I think the governments could play a very significant role. Mm. One point which you touched on earlier was mm. the rise in the number of sovereigns issuing. Mm. And I think that's a very important criteria. It gives the instrument a lot of credibility. It gives the instrument a lot of liquidity. We saw France's issuance of seven to eight billion, making sure that suddenly it becomes an asset class that investors can't do without. So not only do we see regulators across the globe focusing their attention into making it easier or cheaper to issue green bonds, but we're also starting to see sovereigns come out and making sure that the bond has the credibility it needs. Well, thank you. Um, and, and one thing certainly that we have seen in the, uh, in the last few years in the, among international investors, global investors, is this uh, realization on their own that they want to commit to green finance, they want to support sustainable investments. So even without regulatory guidance, that many investors have uh, made it a priority to allocate. Yeah. Uh, right? And we've seen that bo both in terms of regular investors yeah. creating specific green bond funds, whether mm. it's BlackRock or PIMCO. Yeah. All mm. we are starting to see, you know, obviously as Amundi has done, mm. in, in terms of ET, even exchange listed ETFs, mm. which focuses on green bonds. So we've seen the drive from the investors, mm -hmm. who, again, you, you, making it easier for issuers to rationalize mm -hmm. why they should do a green bond. I indeed, and I think that's partly supported uh, some of the successful green masala issuances from yep. um, Indian issuers as well. But uh, uh, Satish, again, back on the Indian market, because in addition to this regulatory directed credit type of support or, or catalyzation, anything else that you see that could help yeah, kickstart? Yeah, I think uh, the credit enhancement, uh, if it can be brought to the table, will enhance the existing uh, market itself. 
because today, as Manish pointed out, there's a kind of a constraint in relation to the rating which you can acquire vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis the existing regulation. Mm -hmm. And uh, till the regulatory push happens in terms of asking these mutual funds and insurance companies and mm -hmm. pension funds to start mm -hmm. providing certain quota of the investment into the green bond, mm -hmm. if a mechanism can be brought forward which enhances the credit uh, rating mm. of the bonds, which is a great enhancement mechanism at a pricing which is viable mm. and not not viable because there are mechanisms available from some of the multilaterals at this juncture, mm. but doesn't work in the Indian context still. So then it can actually open up the market significantly. Right. Yes. And uh, it can be done because again, as I said, that if you create a body mm. which collates uh, the issuance requirement from 10 guys instead of a one guy, automatically the collated rating is very different than the rating because you are having exposure onto the 10 distribution companies in the country which are having a different ratings, you are having a different suppliers. So your credit risk comes down uh, significantly mm -hmm. by having that collateralization done. Yes. And if somebody can put together that collateralization and offer a bond against that, mm -hmm. obviously it will be a bond which will be an acceptable bond. I interesting. Mm -hmm. So you're suggesting either credit enhancement through bond guarantees, mm -hmm. perhaps from multilaterals or others, yes. um, or even domestic financial institutions, or some sort of pooling and collateralization right. uh, to, to de-risk. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Now, my other question was around pricing, and I'm sure this has been discussed many times mm -hmm. over in the last year as the market has evolved. And I'm going to ask Jean-Marie to comment on this, because issuers often ask that, why should I take the trouble to issue a green bond? Mm -hmm. Because it does involve some additional process, mm -hmm. some administrative yeah. work, keeping track, impact monitoring, yeah. et cetera. What is the advantage that I'm getting? So as an investor, mm. for investing in a green bond, would you be willing to provide a, a discount or to the issuer? Would you issue, would be willing to issue in a, yeah. at a lower yield? No, for sure, the, the, investor, the investor can consider green bond as a bond. So mm. the, the, there is no quick gain, I would say, and, mm. uh, because in terms of pricing, it is addicted by the green bond principles that it should be issued at the same price as a credit curve given for a given issuer. Mm -hmm. um, but what we do think is that when you enter into an investment, uh, into a green bond, um, the fact is that you, you have access to more information about the, the use of proceeds of the bond, and so, in fact, to the issuer itself. And so you enter into a dialogue with this issuer, um, so which means that there is more trust and more information sharing. And information has a big value in the market um, because uh, you go into deeper analysis of all these green finance topic um, within the, the business of the issuer. And so, for example, if I take the example of a bank, then you have more color about their real loan book uh, because, for example, you, you, you talked about uh, aggregators, but banks are the natural aggregators of this kind of uh, finance project. Um, and so that is why for us that first step should be towards bank uh, into that great bond market mm -hmm. because they have the ability to create different projects and so to enhance by their own credit uh, the, the, the whole loan book they have on, the, on that topic. And so for us it's very important because it gives us access to better analysis uh, to the credit quality. Uh -huh. And so with, we do think that with that we control better the risk uh, of our portfolio. And of course, there is this extra financial uh, gain because for investors, typically in some countries, you have some regulation mm -hmm. where uh, institutional investors must commit on doing something to mitigate the climate change. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of investment is clearly uh, an answer to that. So it's mm -hmm. the, the, the case in France with the Article uh, 173. It should be the case, I think, soon in some other countries like Sweden. And so, you know, you have this global trend mm. of institutional investors must report about their carbon footprint, about their, mm. uh, their pragmatic action mm. into that direction. I mean, now it's no time for words. It's time to act. Yep. And that's what it is. No, interesting. So, so while, based on your comment, Jean-Marie, it, it seems that even, even if there isn't an immediate pricing advantage, the fact that investors uh, can think of green bonds as a way of accessing better quality because by definition you are making some commitments about use of proceeds and agreeing to disclose certain things which can enhance at least your issue, your investor base and you might be able to access a better market and who knows over time 
some sort of pricing advantage also might might emerge. Yeah, pricing advantage is most more second order yeah. effect. Like technically, uh, as as mentioned, uh, there there is a, a bulk of dedicated investors to that. Yeah. They tend to be very often by an older, mm. so it will put pressure on the spread in a good direction, which will give an opportunity for the issuer for next issuance who have better pricing. Mm. And for the investor who came into that first bond, uh, natural pricing performance, in fact, by uh, spread narrowing. Thank you. So I'm going to now turn uh, the discussion back to the audience and, uh, and see if we have any questions for the panel to build on what you heard or any other clarification you might have. So I see that lady out there. Yeah, please. Um, good afternoon. My name is Ipshita. I'm an environment and resources lawyer. Um, so far, uh, what I understand about green bonds is most intellectual energy has been focusing on how to raise funds for these bonds to actually uh, penetrate the market. My question is, have um, intellectual energies been equally involved in figuring out what an investment ready project would look like and whether you plan to tweak this in accordance with India's environmental needs? So I'm, I might ask uh, one of our you know, issuer colleagues who are more directly involved with the real sector, but as you know, we heard a lot in the panel since yesterday about a number of real sector execution project level issues. And of course, this is the green bonds by themselves are not specifically meant to address project level issues, rather they are supposed to finance a project that is considered eligible. But I would welcome any comments from Manish uh, or sure. Satish. Yeah. So, so it's a very pertinent question mm. uh, because uh, if you have investment ready projects, mm. then automatically you will find the money will come. Uh, now uh, in the Indian context, uh, when we call green, uh, the most important sector is the renewable energy. Uh, going forward, we'll see more sectors. We'll see water, we'll see energy efficiency. So the major risk which has to be addressed, uh, which I talked about, is the counterparty risk, the off-taker risk. Now, uh, in India, we have seen that uh, the state utilities, they are not in the best of health. Uh, th there are uh, big uh, ticket reforms which are happening to address that. But in the interim, it has to be addressed uh, through the contracts. So we need to have strong contracts, strong power purchase agreements, which address the issue of evacuation, which addresses the issue of delay in payments. So we need to have an escrow account. Uh, in fact, if you uh, see in the past, some good steps have happened. Like uh, I remember there was a issuance by UP State Electricity Board. And that was backed by an escrow account uh, where the commitment was given by the UP government that in case there is a delay in payment, then RBI can actually uh, uh, set aside the central assistance to UP and put it in the escrow account. So that was a very uh, smart structure to have. Uh, similarly, uh, as I talked earlier, uh, there was an auction in Reva where the power purchase agreement was very strongly structured that in case there is any uh, delay in uh, evacuation or there is no evacuation, then there is a deemed generation clause. So the state utility has to still make the payment. So we need to have much stronger power purchase agreements in the renewable sector. And I think that will uh, make the projects uh, bankable. Plus, as Satish talked about, uh, we also need to have some kind of a guarantee structures. And in India, there are like some multilaterals have those structures, even Indian institution like IFCL, they provide partial guarantees. So we have to find some way to enhance the rating of these, uh, uh, these uh, instruments to around say double A. Around that kind of a rating, you have a interest from the investors. So once you have a rating of AA, then you will find uh, even mutual funds might show interest. Plus, as I talked about, uh, there's a huge, uh, a huge amount of corpus lying with uh, insurance companies and pension funds, uh, which is growing at the rate of 15 to 20% per annum. And with the reduction in the yields of the government securities, those investors are looking also for a yield pickup. So this can become a very important asset class for them. So I think this is the way to mitigate uh, this kind of risk. Thank you. I just like to say that there is uh, no dearth of projects or the opportunities uh, for which the green bonds can be used. Uh, on one hand, India has a target of 175 gigawatt of renewable energy. We are at currently 50, 60 gigawatt. Uh, if you just recycle the capital which has gone in today with a green bond, that itself is a big market. 
uh, where there's a proven track record of having delivered, proven cash flows are there going forward. Though it's the kind of a securitization which I'm talking about where the application may not be there, but which addresses the issue of the rating much more clearly than a project risk uh, which comes into the picture when the new project is getting involved over there. So there's no dearth of projects as such uh, in terms of uh, the market which you can have from the issuer side. Uh, the constraint is in terms of the subscriber, that uh, who are the bodies, how will they subscribe, and various constraints they have in terms of subscribing to these bonds, be it an exchange rate issue, be it a rating issue, uh, be it a kind of a contract entity in this country being an issue over there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Questions? Yes, please. Just a very specific question, and first of all, I'll second the view that there is a rising demand from other sectors beyond RE, which we are seeing. I work for Climate Bonds Initiative and interact with a lot of actors, so from water to agriculture to, you know, even smaller scale assets. There is uh, definitely uh, an interest in exploring this market. So my question is very specific to the IFC m and um, uh, a $2 billion fund for emerging markets. What specific actions have you designed or are in the process of exploring to spur the domestic investor demand uh, in India? Jamari, you want to take that one? I can add so something too. I would say first, um, by going into a market, by saying that you, you create a first demand with the ability uh, to take some lead orders for uh, some new bond issuances, then you, you give, I would say, the foundation uh, of a market. Thereafter, there is the technical assistance facility, which will be uh, run by uh, IFC uh, and deployed, um, I would say, on different local basis uh, in order to stimulate uh, also the, the, the demand that uh, the banks can, can give. So that's help them, helping them to match the requirements in terms of uh, impact reporting, second opinion provider, uh, all these kind of stuff, which can be seen as complex by issuers and also, cost, and also costly. So that, that's very, very important. I would say that from Amund side, we are on our investor position. On an IFC side, in a parallel run, they will be there to stimulate that, that potential demand. So I would say that there's the size effect yeah. first, and the, the way to accompany uh, issuers or potential issuers. And of course, we, we do believe that it creates the conditions for a virtuous circle. Because when you have um, uh, first success, then uh, it gives example. And in India, we can say that we, are, we will not be the first. That there were uh, previous issuances. We are already in talks with some banks for uh, new issuances coming. Um, and so that's why for us, it's just a question of time rather than uh, real uh, uncertainties, I would say. Yeah, um, yeah I, th I think I would agree with Jean-Marie that the investors in this Green Cornerstone Fund, of course, will be global international investors. But it can certainly have a catalytic effect because if the signal to the market is that there is at least a clear and visible investor in, in dollar issuances initially out of this market, then it's not, I wouldn't say it's that far off that uh, domestic investors might also start taking much more of an interest in, in the same issuers or even additional issuers coming out from the kind of sectors you were, you were talking about. And as we heard earlier from the panel, the domestic investor market might need some kind of uh, incentives or directed credit type of uh, encouragement, or perhaps like it has happened in the international markets, many of the investors start becoming more and more aware and conscious and start making investor allocations themselves because they believe in the in, in the long term support to this uh, you know this this particular segment so thank you yeah i'm uh, I, i'm deepak dasgupta from terry mm. also working with governments including uh, in france so uh, curious to know there's going to be a one planet summit in a few days time on 12th of December. And part of it is going to talk about sovereign state actions to spur the green bond market to provide the guarantee space. Any thoughts from the panel here as to what you're expecting to see happen 
on the 12th and beyond. Sure. As we discussed earlier, and thanks for the question, as we discussed earlier, we see this growing trend of sovereigns wanting to come into the markets. So we've seen three already, with the largest issuance, of course, out of France. But we've seen several other sovereigns, such as Nigeria, Morocco, et cetera, who've already announced plans, Bangladesh, to do green bonds. So clearly there is a conscious move by sovereigns to increase their footprint in the area. And as we discussed earlier, it's, it is a very good thing for them to do. This is something which sets a standard, a benchmark for their constituent uh, corporates or financials to come out. And uh, we are going to see more of this. Indeed, and I think uh, one of the things that the market itself, investment banks, issuers, investors, are trying to work together on, as I mentioned earlier through the green bond principles, is to encourage as much harmonization and consistency across these different guidelines coming from different sovereigns or different countries, because that way then you can bro both broaden and, and deepen the market, but without necessarily making it too heavy handed, because you want mm -hmm. to allow some you know, uh, initiative and uh, creativity in that uh, as the market grows. Thank you. Vipul. <clears throat> Thanks, Manish. Uh, Vipul Bhagat with the IFC. Um, I'm curious to hear um, a couple of panelists, if they could compare and contrast what's happened in the Chinese green bond market and the Indian green bond market in terms of its development. It sounds like there's been a much greater impetus um, by the regulators in China to get green bond issuances to happen. I'm wondering if the same thing is happening in India um, and whether that could push the market along uh, a bit more. I don't know if many state banks in India, for example, have issued like ABC and ICBC have in, in China, for example. I know some private banks have. The other question I have maybe for the Indian panelists is, is, it a, is there a possibility to marry municipal finance with green bond issuances? We heard from several municipalities yesterday in the cities panel who are doing a lot of innovative projects. And could a Bhubaneshwar, for example, not issue a green bond? Can that be another impetus to essentially push this market in India? Thanks. Maybe we can take up the Indian question first. Yeah. So that's interesting. So I think uh, mm. uh, I'll respond by saying first that the regulator of SEBI has already finalized the kind of a guidelines with respect to the green bond issuance over there. So one of the regulatory hurdles is over uh, from a facilitation of the process perspective as such. Coming to the second part of the question in relation to the municipal corporation, yes. Uh, in fact, Ministry of Urban Development uh, has recently announced a 2% interest subvention on a green bond issuance from the municipal corporation. Uh, relatively, the municipal corporation bond market in India is a very shallow bond market. And the track record of the municipal corporation in terms of getting a rating and providing uh, serviceability of it has been poor. And to that extent, till the municipal corporation bond market itself changes its positioning, uh, adding a green to it will take a little time from my perspective. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I agree with that. Today, uh, it's very difficult to fund a municipality. Uh, it requires a very strong structures. Uh, there's a issue regarding their payment ability, you know, their uh, financials. So uh, the investors have been quite uh, okay to take risk of the state utilities, state electricity boards. But on municipalities still, uh, I guess a lot of work needs to happen. However, the clear opportunity exists to yeah. really convert a municipal corporation bond into a green bond. That opportunity very much is there. Great. Ronnie, on the China sure. versus India. Mm -hmm. On the China versus India, mm -hmm. Vipul, thanks for the question. Clearly, the Chinese volume is significantly higher than anything we've seen issuance out of India. But we also got to keep in context how much is the total volume of bond issuance out of China and how much of that is green. Now, Indian issuers as a rule issue a fraction of how much Chinese issuers issue. So it's not just in terms of absolute numbers, but in terms of relative numbers as well. But clearly, there's a lot for the Indian issuers to catch up in the sense that Chinese issuance makes up 17% of total volume today. 14% is directly linked to CNY, not out of the 70%, but out of total currencies issued. But at the same time, we see Indian issuers not only increasing its frequency, but also in terms of quantum. You know, yesterday we saw Power Finance, today we see IRFC. We did the first deal out of India for Exim India, and we saw Access Bank coming. 
we've seen several of the green core bonds coming. So I clearly think India's on the right track. It needs the impetus, it needs the investable projects that can use the funds that are ready for the Indian corpus to issue. Pricing is incredibly tight. When we did the exit bond, if memory serves, serves me right, it was around 2.75% two years ago, and it was the tightest bond they had ever issued. So the, it, it provides the pricing. We need the Indian issuers to come out into the markets in line with what other international issuers are doing, and it's the same. You know, just um, to illustrate Ranabhi's point, I, mean, I remember, I think earlier this year or late last year, there was a green bond issuance from one of our clients in, in Turkey. And that bond was oversubscribed 13 times. Mm. So, so while on the one hand, investors still want to see yield parity mm. based simply on credit rather than on the green label, mm. but the oversubscription that you mm. were also referring to, that does seem to indicate that there is a growing, Clearly. deeper uh, appetite in the market. So uh, you have Just a point to add. Yeah. Uh, from the Indian context, See, today, if you see the macro scenario, uh, most of the funding, not only for uh, green, but also for infrastructure, has been done by banks. But banks are subject to uh, limits on the group, on a company, and on a sector. And especially in the power sector, uh, the exposure of banks is very high. So for Indian uh, developers, it's extremely important to find a new investor class. So uh, that is one reason. And the other reason is that we are expecting much higher capacities to come in. Uh, one is renewable energy itself. You know, India is talking about 175 gigawatts. That itself will require more than 100 billion. Plus, we'll see growth in electrical vehicles. We'll see growth in water. So the fund requirement is so high that uh, it will be important to go to the green bond market and to the offshore green bond market <coughs> because uh, the Indian financial community itself will have limitations. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Can we bring the mic over? Here? Hi, my name is Saya Korkala, and I represent SCB, the bank who, together with the World Bank, created green bonds. Mm -hmm. um, in the beginning, the poll uh, said that the biggest, uh, one of the biggest obstacles uh, in making uh, this uh, big thing in Asia is inconsistent. Um, uh, standards. Uh, I would like to ask the panel, do you agree to that? Uh, are the, uh, is there inconsistent standards? And then number two, uh, what is the lowest hanging fruit to make them less inconsistent? Thank you. Any thoughts from our friends here? here? Rosan, uh, we'll, uh, so, Ronald? Sure. Mm. Look, all of these principles that we see spread across the various countries are based on the green bond principles, of which there are four, as everyone knows. And I think more and more governments or sovereigns are making sure that all of them adhere to them, because even if their principles are different from the four pillars of the green bond principles, then the investors will not accept them as green, rating agencies will not accept them, and the issuer will fail. So I think there is greater consistency in moving towards at least maintaining the fundamental green bond principles. Now, some sovereigns, more than others, encourage it more. As I mentioned, China introduced the green bond handbook, which spurred issuance. SEBI has done a fantastic job in terms of regulating or ordering the green bond issuances out of India. So I think there is greater consciousness. What we need now more is more countries or more issuers from different countries to come out. We haven't seen an overseas green bond issuance from Malaysia. We haven't seen an overseas green bond issuance from Philippines. We haven't seen an overseas green bond issuance from Indonesia. Now, these are countries which issue significant amounts every year. So if we can get into the issuer's mind first, the regulators are in more than countries than not, very amenable to providing the support. But we need to turn the issuer's mind first, as Monisha initially mentioned, that to do that incremental work in terms of tracking the transactions, in terms of you know, prioritizing, or the use of proceeds guidelines themselves. How do you make sure that a project that you select is green or not, putting together the processes? That incremental work is worth it for them. But that is changing every day, and we do see you know, more and more issuers and regulators coming on the same platform. 
Well, thank you, Ranabir. And one of the ways uh, IFC is trying to help the process along, and many of my financial institutions, group uh, colleagues, as well as climate business colleagues from IFC will know this better, is that we work with many issuers to actually advise them, not just on, on the investment side or the issuance side, but also on the process itself. And it's encouraging to note that, Ranabir, you said that SEBI guidelines are broadly consistent with green bond principles, which we have helped develop uh, on the global side. Uh, together with you know yourselves and many other market players there, so that's something we can certainly bring to the market in offering that knowledge transfer, so that our clients can kind of follow the same standards, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, please. Uh, hi, I'm Swati from Terry. So uh, first of all, thank you so much for this insightful uh, session. Uh, so my question is largely to do with the bonds market. So we see that there are several kinds of bonds which are coming up in the market. So for instance, there are forest bonds, there are social bonds, development bonds, green bonds, climate bonds. So do we see these multi multiplicity of frameworks creating challenges for the green bonds market altogether? Or do we see them converging somewhere down the line uh, in the future? So if you can get some perspectives from the issuers and the investors on that. Very interesting question, but this sense this has to be the last question. Uh, uh, so is there anyone else that I, I can combine this question with before I ask the panel to address this? Because we are pretty much almost over, over time. So, so, so let me just turn back to the panel to address this one last interesting question and then we'll close. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. You want to address it? You want me to take the question? Yeah. Hmm. Um, clearly, it is not so good to have too many norms uh, too many definitions for what is a bone or what, what is an impact bone, I would say, which can be both an mm -hmm. environmental topic or social and so on. As of today, what we can say is that the more mature uh, market within that uh, area is the green bone market, for sure, uh, in terms of size, in terms of uh, legal documentation, uh, in terms of standards. Mm -hmm. in that, there is a big work uh, which has to be done on social bonds, for example. Mm -hmm. We do think that it is important because it will address other topics, which is not in the concern of uh, green bonds, uh, and we need that, and this is one of the pillars of all ESG analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, we, we talked about uh, water. Uh, so water can be an environmental uh, mm -hmm. point, but it can also be a real social point when mm -hmm. it comes to uh, water for mm -hmm. cities and so on. So it's more mm -hmm. the social bond for us and the water treatment and so on is more on the mm -hmm. environmental topic. So, this multiplicity, this multiplicity is good because it answers to the problematics we have for social and responsible investment. But for sure, we must be very careful that a market is not only a norm. A market is an investor community facing issuers and then with exchange, so based on common standards. So I think we got it on the, on the green bonds on development on developed countries. We will get it in, a, in emerging markets soon. Um, for the other initiatives, I would say there is a lot of work to do first to, to come to that level of uh, outstanding amount on a number of exchange also. Because Great. Thank you, Romari. And of course, please feel free to reach out later to the panel members to delve further into some of these themes. So I'm going to just close by a very short summary. I think you heard uh, some excellent insights from the panel. Uh, clearly, some of the top issues in everybody's mind here to help develop this market in India is we need a good flow of quality projects. So project quality is, is important, a good flow of projects is important because ultimately green bonds are a financing instrument. They have to finance uh, you know, uh, eligible projects. In order to develop the domestic investor market, it, it may need some combination of the rising levels of awareness of sustainability among investors and making commitments in that direction like many international investors have done. The process could probably be accelerated through some regulatory encouragement, perhaps within this directed credit priority sector framework. Uh, I think this question of credit enhancement to help uh, de-risk or raise the credit worthiness of uh, potential issuers, I think that seems to be an important way of increasing the number of issuers who can access the market. There was an interesting discussion on, on pricing. I think pricing roughly seems to be still more, more or less at par with regular bonds of these issuers. But I think the immediate benefit clearly is in terms of investor diversification and deepening, opening up and deepening up the market for, for your bonds. And maybe eventually there some kind of a pricing advantage 
might also, also emerge. So with those comments, uh, we will close here, and I would like to really thank uh, our expert panel here for sharing their insights with us. Thank you. And the audience for having engaged in such an interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you.